Good morning or afternoon. My name is Janie Montblanc, and on behalf of the Great Basin Fire Science Exchange and our partners, I would like to welcome you to this webinar titled, Do You Suffer from Biocrust Blindness? What You Need to Know About Biological Soil Crusts in the Great Basin. Presented by Lee Condon, Research Ecologist with the USGS in Corvallis, Oregon. Before I introduce our speaker, I will go over some webinar details. If you have questions or comments for the speaker or me, please type them into the questions window of your control panel located at the top right of your screen at any time during the webinar. I will field your questions for the speaker after the presentation. I also want to let you know that whatever you do in your control panel does not affect the webinar presentation, so you're welcome to type a test message or test your audio at any time during the webinar. If you're having problems with your audio, please open your audio window and check your audio selections. Now I would like to introduce our presenter. Lee Condon is a biocrust and plant community research ecologist with the USGS Forest and Rangeland Ecosystem Science Center in Corvallis, Oregon. She has worked throughout the West on projects related to landscape and disturbance ecology. Her work focuses on translating ecological processes into sustainable land management and restoration practices. Welcome, Lee, and thank you for presenting today. Thanks, Janie, and thanks to everybody joining in today. I really appreciate you taking the time to listen to what I have to say. And, um, okay, good. Can everyone see my screen? Not yet. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> Did you press the little show my screen button or arrow? It went away. It went away. Let's see. Well, in your control panel, Wait. at the very top, it should be, yeah, there we go. Got it. Okay. All right. Great. Um, so what I'm going to be presenting today is some of my dissertation work. And then there's been enough interest in that, uh, that my dissertation was on biological soil crust in the Great Basin that I've been able to continue some of this as a postdoc fellow through uh, USGS. And kind of the inspiration for this talk was um, as I was starting my dissertation and telling people about what I was working on, I was faced with one of two responses. One being, oh, you work on biological soil crust? That's cool. Like, there's interest in biological soil crust. People are really excited to hear more about biological soil crust. But the other response I got was that um, biological soil crusts are not in the Great Basin, that I talked to Professor so-and-so at X University, and they said that biocrusts are not in the Great Basin. And I feel like people often don't see what they don't know. And so with this talk, I'm hoping to alleviate some biocrust blindness and to maybe fuel some of the excitement that's existing about biocrust, and especially in the Great Basin. Um, who? How do I advance the slide? Um, it worked earlier. Is it yeah. Oh, okay. There we go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I want to start off talking about just what are biocrust or biological soil crust? Because another question I often get is, well, how long does it take biocrust to recover from disturbance? And that's a much more complicated question than I think people realize, because biocrust don't refer to just one type of organism. They revert, refer to a whole suite of organisms that live in the interspaces between vascular plants in arid and semi-arid environments. So they can be lichens, they can be fungi, they can be mosses, cyanobacteria, they can be all of these things. And so I want to introduce you to a couple of common biocrusts in the Great Basin. Uh, on the left, we have Kalima tenax. It's a cyanolichen, a gelatinous lichen. Um, it's a nitrogen fixer. It's common throughout the range. And on the right, I've got Centrichia ruralis. It's a common moss, later successional moss in the system. And on the upper right there, if you can see it, we've got the two growing together. Um, so, I don't know if people would have anticipated that there'd be a little pop quiz at the beginning of this talk, but I want you to take a moment and look out across this landscape shot and see if you can pick out where the biocrusts are. So, thinking about interspaces uh, between vascular plants here, 
and we'll do this really quick because I can't see anybody's uh, face to tell how quickly or not they're seeing these things. But where I've put in little pink circles, um, I've highlighted some of the biocrest. And the one I picked out is white in the picture. Uh, this is Saurus cerebriformis. I'll give you a better look here. Uh, it's a squamulose lichen. I think the species name cerebiformis comes from the fissures in the lichen. They look like little brains to me. Um, so there's one of them. And I've kind of I kind of set you up to fail a little bit that I think looking at biocrust is more kind of belly botany. You really need to be down on your hands and knees to see biocrust. And um, so there I am down on my hands and knees looking at biocrust. And this is a, a method that I've used throughout some of my surveys in the Great Basin. Uh, I have a little quadrat that I take out with me that's um, a quarter meter by a quarter meter. And I've got wires set up across that little quadrat frame. So you could do point intercept along that quadrat frame, or you can estimate cover in there. And a lot of our common biocrest species are um, what you refer to as poikilohydric. And so that just means they're really opportunistic in how they use water. So I've got my spray bottle there, and I spray the soil surface. And some of the biocrusts will just kind of light up in that moment because they're taking up the water and they're starting to photosynthesize. So they're much easier to see. So for scale here, um, I've got this picture of Centrichia ruralis that we saw earlier. And um, the wire square there is just five centimeters by five centimeters. So you can get a sense of um, the size of some of these crusts. And so in this shot, Centrichia ruralis is larger than life. And here's another common one, a vagrant. This is Aspicillia hispida. Um, some folks say that the vagrants are more common where you have less disturbance. And here's another showy vagrant, uh, Xanthoparmelia nochlora croa. And these vagrants um, just blow along the soil surface. And they're able to collect water in that way, photosynthesize in that way. And um, that's how these particular forms of biocrest are. Not all, but some. And so I wanted to give you a little background as to how I became interested in biocrest. Uh, I have a, this is kind of a roundabout story, but I have a master's from the University of Nevada, Reno. And what came out of some of that work uh, was looking at site resistance in the Great Basin and that being related to cover of cheatgrass and we were also interested in cover of sagebrush after fire because really one of the big issues in the system is that the fire regime is changing. Fire is becoming more frequent of larger extent because we have invasion by annual grasses such as cheatgrass. So I wanted to see if we could um, figure out how these things would naturally recover, uh, that being sagebrush, perennial herbaceous plants on the landscape, how would they naturally recover after fire? And so I used a technique referred to as structural equation modeling. And there's some symbology that's commonly used in structural equation modeling. Uh, Double-headed arrows are used to represent correlations. Single-headed arrows represent direct relationships. And if the arrow is solid, it's a positive relationship. If it's dashed, it's a negative relationship. So I could use this method uh, to account for the environmental variables that we thought were playing a role. And sagebrush has to seed back in after fire. So thinking that proximity to unburned patches would play a role here. Um, the closer you are to an unburned patch, the more seed source you're going to have for sagebrush to come in after fire. And there's been a lot of work done on pre-fire canopy cover. So if you have a denser canopy cover, you're likely to have less understory, less sagebrush um, that's going to come back after fire. So that site's going to be more prone to invasion. It's going to have lower site resistance to cheatgrass. But what was new about this work was that we took into account perennial herbaceous cover. So the thought being where you had more perennial herbaceous cover, you'd have less cheatgrass after fire, and you'd have more sagebrush. And this is a, what we're hoping for in this system. So the results of this model, um, 
where we had more pre-fire canopy cover, you did have less sagebrush, Artemisia tridentata, after fire. Um, but as we were um, hypothesizing, where you had more perennial herbaceous cover, you did have less cheatgrass, Bromus tectorum, after fire, and you had more sagebrush. So, but why biocrest in the Great Basin? And, um, you know, so the way my mind works is if you can picture the processes or components that would have been in a system uh, prior to disturbance or um, prior to seeing it in maybe a degraded state that we're finding it in now, um, you know, maybe that will help with the restoration and how we can manage that system better. And so perennial herbaceous cover uh, in arid lands and perennial cover in general can be fairly low. It might be just 10 to 20 percent, but you have a fair amount of inner space then in those systems. And so what would have been in the inner spaces, and if we look at arid lands globally, the answer to that question would be biocrest. And <laughs> I don't know how many of you are familiar with um, the movie Back to the Future. I'm somebody that grew up in the 80s, so my childhood was somewhat shaped by this movie. And the thought or premise behind it was that if you could go back in time and change one thing, how would that affect current day? How would that affect the future? And so that's what kind of happens in Back to the Future. So I think about that with some of my projects. And um, so as I've been interested in biocrest recovery uh, from fire across the Great Basin, I decided to go back and look at previous work that had been done on biocrest recovery from fire. And I plotted them, uh, these study locations up on Google Earth and just made a quick sketch of the extent of the Great Basin. And you can see that in this type of work, the Great Basin has really been kind of a black hole. Most of the work that's been done is on the perimeter of the Great Basin. So then maybe it's not a surprise that people have said um, biocrest or not in the Great Basin because there hasn't been that much work done on it. So biocrest, um, again, kind of uh, why do we care so much? And if we think about ecosystem functions and services that biocrest provide globally, they help influence nutrient cycling. Um, some of them fix atmospheric nitrogen, which then make it available to vascular plants. They play roles in soil water, both runoff and infiltration, so that you can have areas of concentrated water that then are going to be available for vascular plants. And they also contribute to soil erosion, so they help to hold the soils in place. And if you only have maybe up to 20% vascular plant cover, um, there's a lot of soil that could possibly be exposed and needs to be held in place by something. And biological soil crusts fill that role. So thinking about site resistance in the Great Basin and invasion by cheatgrass and other annual invasive grasses, um, you know, the mechanisms or functions that cheatgrass is changing include changes to nutrient cycling you end up with a much looser nitrogen cycle where you have cheatgrass. You have more nitrate, which is more easily leached from a site. Um, cheatgrass uses soil water earlier in the growing season, and so it's, there's less soil water available for vascular plants, native plants to use. And cheatgrass also alters soil erosion. And I've heard folks say that, well, cheatgrass has a lot of shallow, fibrous roots. It does contribute to holding soils in place. But we know that it promotes fire. And if you have frequent fire, then you're going to be losing those soils. There's nothing to hold the soil in place. So um, take that for what it is. So something else I commonly hear when I talk about my work is that we're not in 1890 anymore. You can't go back in time to before cheatgrass really became established in the system. We can't go back and say that um, there were more biocrusts there at that particular point in time. And I have to say, it's true that we're not in 1890 anymore, but it's also true that we're not in 2003 anymore. 
And we now have monitoring data that spans the entire Great Basin. And it's the assessment, inventory, and monitoring data set. And um, if any of the folks involved in that work are listening today, I want to thank them for this data set because I feel like it's really going to allow us to do a lot in the region. And um, so how it's collected is that there's technicians that go out to predetermine points on the landscape. And they set up two transects, perpendicular transects, uh, 50 feet in length, and they do line point intercept along these transects. Um, I think it's 102 points that they end up with. And included in this data, in this data is assessing basal ground cover. So did they hit bare soil? Did they hit rock? Um, did they hit litter? Or they would also note if they hit moss or lichen. And so I've taken this data, um, I've got about 3,500 points now that um, were collected sometime between 2011 and 2015. And um, I just noted, uh, well, so I summarized by plot and said if there was any noted presence of lichen, and if so, that's a solid filled in circle on the map here. And if there was no lichen noted on that plot, it's a white circle. And I have the region looked at uh, divided up by MLRA, or major land resource area. And so that's just kind of a delineation that identifies an area that's more homogenous in regards to soils, plant communities, land use, climate within the region. And because Nevada's been kind of, I think, especially overlooked in some of this work, um, I've also included two additional regions, one being the Southern Nevada Basin and Range. So that's kind of shown in the um, um, magenta color there. And the kind of lighter blue, well, more periwinkle color is the Mojave Desert. So we get most of uh, Nevada in there. And I think we've um, alleviated the concern here that biocrasts do not occur in the Great Basin, because uh, clearly they do. Here they are. And I've done the same thing with mosses. So again, a filled in triangle this time is the presence of a moss. If it's a white triangle, there weren't mosses found on that plot. And there's something kind of interesting that happens here. So if I draw a line, just as we're getting down to Southern Nevada, uh, right through the Southern Nevada Basin and Range, you look above that line and we've got a fair amount of moss. But you look below that line, and there's not so much moss. A few presences, but not very much. And so what's going on here, um, still have some work to do on this, could be climate. Maybe one of the more charismatic moss species drops out, but there's definitely a shift in the system here. And I just wanted to share with you this kind of quick overview. Um, don't get overwhelmed by the amount of things on this bar graph, but I have the MLRAs on the x-axis and proportion of plots on the y-axis. And pink bars are presence of lichen, so the number of plots that showed uh, that had a lichen presence. Green bars are the number of plots that had moss presence. Blue is if uh, there were plots that showed both lichens and mosses. And a gray bar means that there was an absence of both lichens and mosses. And then the letters above the groupings of bars, an L being lichen and M being moss, just indicates if there were more lichen or moss plots for that major land resource area. And so what we see here is that the more northerly MLRAs, the Malheur High Plateau that's in the middle there, um, moving a little towards the right, the Oahe High Plateau, and the Snake River Plains all have more plots with mosses which um, fits with work by Roger Rosentretter and others, saying that the more northerly part of the range is dominated by mosses, and as you get further to the south, um, it's more lichens in the system. So I thought that was neat. And something else to pull out here is that uh, you can see that in each case, the gray bar is higher than um, all the other bars. So there's a lot of absences of lichens and mosses uh, across the region too. So more work to be done as to why on this too. Okay, 
So this is great. We've shown that there are biological soil crusts across the Great Basin, um, but I think it's important to note uh, what's their function or what kind of role are they playing here. And so being interested in site resistance in the region, I asked the question, do biocrests contribute to site resistance in the presence of fire and grazing across the sagebrush steppe of the Great Basin? And I was lucky enough to have access to a data set that Dave Pike, Gene Chambers, and others are involved in. Uh, it was published by Kevin Knudsen in 2014, but it has consists of 87 fires across the Great Basin, and um, it's a chronosequence approach. So um, we've got time since fire of since 1970 or 2001, all the fires fit within that range. Uh, the soils are some type of loam, and they were surveyed for plant cover. And so what I did was I went back and I resurveyed these plots. They were originally done with the Herrick's method, and so I replicated that. It's a spoke design of three 50-meter transects, and I went out with my little quadrat that you saw earlier, and every 10 meters along those transects put down a quadrat and surveyed for vegetation as well as biological soil crust. And so I came back to my old friend structural equation modeling and kind of the um, simplest way to start with the structural equation model is setting up a meta model. So really broadly, what do you think is happening in the system? And so I'm interested in cheatgrass cover or site resistance given these two disturbances. Um, I've already shown that perennial herbaceous cover plays a role in how much cheatgrass cover you have after fire. Um, work by Mike Reisner and others has shown that, at least in eastern Oregon, if you have more biocrest cover, you have less cover of cheatgrass. We know that there's some interaction between perennial herbaceous cover and biocrest, that there's nutrients shared between these two, uh, where perennial herbaceous plants, vegetation, is growing in close proximity to biocrest. Uh, these plants tend to have um, higher nutrients, they tend to produce more seed, they're just more robust. And so we're looking at this um, in relation to grazing, thinking that grazing would affect both cover of biocrust and perennial herbaceous plants, and that fire would also affect um, cover of biocrust and perennial herbaceous plants and that you'd have some interaction between the two, that it's often noted that uh, cows just prefer to graze greener grass and it tends to be greener where there's fire. Okay, so getting into the nitty gritty of this model. Um, you know, I wonder if I can close my screen a little here. Let's see, oops, oh, maybe this will work. Okay, so, um, site resistance is represented by cheatgrass cover. Um, I think I can't see all of this. Uh-oh. Technical difficulties. Oops. Okay, so cheatgrass cover um, represents site resistance. And I'm trying to fit more with Mike Reisner's model to see if results from his model um, are true across the region. So I've represented native bunch grass, native bunch grasses with both composition and cover. Thinking that where you have more cover of bunch grasses, you have less cheatgrass. Um, that this would also be influenced by gap community structure. So where you have larger and more variable size of gaps between perennial plants, uh, the site's more prone to invasion by cheatgrass. Uh, if you have more bunch grass, your gaps are smaller. Um, other things to include in the model here, percent bare ground, shrub cover, mosses and lichens to represent biocrust, and thinking that where you have more moss and lichen cover, you have less cover of cheatgrass, uh, that mosses might facilitate lichens coming back into the system. Uh, shrubs might be protecting bunch grasses from disturbances, such as grazing or trampling. Uh, they would do the same for biocrust. Uh, more shrub cover would relate to less cover of cheatgrass. Uh, more bare soil, you're going to have more sites that could potentially be invaded by cheatgrass. 
If you have more gaps, you have more bare soil. Uh, more moss, you'd have less bare soil. More grass, you'd have less bare soil. More moss might facilitate more grasses coming back into the system. The same being true of lichens. And then I wanted to characterize fire, so I did that. I tried to do that as we characterize fire regimes in different ecosystems. So I stated whether or not a site burned, uh, the time since fire, so kind of getting into the frequency of fire, and the acres burned, so getting into the extent of the fire, size of the fire. And if you had a burn site, we expected to see less shrub cover, less bio crust cover, at least in the short term, less bunch grass cover. Uh, larger gaps between perennial plants and more tea grass cover. With increasing time since fire, we thought we would see recovery of shrubs, recovery of bio crust, and recovery of bunch grasses, and that this would also be related to a reduction in tea grass cover. If you had a larger fire, we thought that you would have less shrub cover within the burn perimeter because things like um, sagebrush have to seed back in after fire. Uh, this would also relate to reduced bio crust cover, reduced cover of bunch grasses, and more cover of cheatgrass. And getting into characterizing grazing intensity across the region, um, we've used distance to water, cow dung density, proportion of active AUMs. So um, this one might sound a little tricky. It's not that tricky, but um, so I got data from the BLM Rangeland Administration System, and what it states for a given allotment is the permitted number of AUM, so animal unit months um, based on forage, uh, how much grazing they think a particular site, a particular allotment can handle, and the number of active AUMs on that site, as well as the number of suspended AUMs on that site. So um, if the managers thought it was necessary to suspend AUMs because forage wasn't being sustained for whatever reason, um, there was a suspended number of AUMs. So I made this into a proportion because allotments are of different um, productivity levels, they're of different sizes across the region. So this is how I attempted to standardize grazing across the region. So we've got proportion of active AUMs and we also have proportion of suspended AUMs. So hypotheses here include that where you have increasing distance to water, you'd have uh, less cow dung, so that cows like to stay closer to water, and at the same time, if your cows were closer to water, the further you got from that water, uh, the more bunch grass cover you would have. With increasing cow dung density, you'd have a change in the composition of bunch grasses. Cows really do prefer uh, certain grass species over others and that this would relate to the size of the gaps between perennial plants. Uh, if you had more AUMs on the landscape, you would have less bunch grass cover, more cow dung, and more cheat grass. And then with suspended AUMs, we thought that you would have less shrub cover and less cover of native bunch grasses. And then thinking that where a site burned, uh, that the cows would prefer to use that site, that we would still see that, uh, that you would have a higher density of cow dung and wanted to take into account some environmental variables here. So we included heat load exposure, thinking that where you had a drier, hotter site, you would have less cover of native bunch grasses. And if you had a sandier site, droughtier site, uh, you would have more bare ground cover and a different composition of native bunch grasses. Okay. It's always good for me to step away from that for a moment. I think happy thoughts, being out in the field looking at biocrust. So uh, getting back to the resulting model, here are our preliminary results. I don't want you to get overwhelmed by this, but I'm just going to highlight a few relationships that came out of the resulting model um, that are of interest. So the first being between lichen cover over on the right and cheatgrass cover we did find a negative relationship between lichen cover and cheatgrass cover. Um, if an area burned that was greater in size, we had less shrub cover after fire, and we also had less bunch grass cover after fire. 
um, if we had suspended AUMs on an allotment, increasing numbers of suspended AUMs, we had less shrub cover and less bunch grass cover. And if a site burned, we still saw, or we saw um, a greater density of cow dung on that site. Okay, so I kind of prefer this view. Um, within structural equation modeling, you can summarize relationships. So if you're interested in, uh, let's say, cheatgrass cover, and you have a number of factors that influence cheatgrass cover, you can summarize those effects and see kind of the net effects of particular factors on your variable of interest. So here we can see that what had the greatest effect on cheatgrass cover was whether or not a site burned. Uh, with increasing time since fire, we saw a reduction in cheatgrass cover. Uh, TAB, that's total area burned. If the fire was larger, if we had suspended AUMs on that site, we tended to have more cheatgrass cover. Uh, being interested in native bunch grass cover, because we know that where you have more perennial herbaceous cover, you tend to have less uh, cover of cheatgrass. Um, native bunch grass cover was positively affected by whether or not a site burned and time since fire over the um, range of time since fire that we had. But at the same time, if a fire was larger and if there were suspended AUMs, we had reduced bunch grass cover. Lichen cover, uh, lichens seem to be really negatively affected by whether or not a site burned and had a negative relationship with time since fire. And um, this is one that's been hard for me to wrap my head around. And I half wonder if it has something to do with the lichen cover that was present on site prior to the fire that um, you would think that you would see lichen recovery with time since fire, but maybe our range of time since fire isn't high enough there to see that. And uh, shrub cover, so shrubs are really negatively affected by whether or not a site burned. Makes sense, they burned up in the fire. Uh, uh, if the total area burned was higher, uh, you had less shrub cover after fire. Also, if AUMs were suspended on a site, you had less shrub cover. Okay, so focusing in on the biotic community here and the role of biocrust, um, this method also allows us to see the net effects of particular biotic um, components uh, on cheatgrass cover. So on the left there, where I've got the light green color and the kind of orangey color, that represents moss and lichen cover. So that where you had higher cover of mosses and lichens, you had less cover of cheatgrass. And you can see that we found the expected relationship with native bunch grass cover. If you had more cover of these grasses, we had less cheatgrass cover. And the same was true, um, although a small effect of there was a difference uh, in native bunch grass composition that seem to affect cheatgrass cover as well. So, and another point I want to make uh, in looking at this graph is that we're kind of in the trenches here with our plots that um, you might say that the effect of moss and lichen on cheatgrass is weak and it is small, but these are plots that are grazed and burned and kind of have a, they cover a range of disturbances, but have a history of disturbance. So we're still seeing this relationship on these disturbed sites. And moving over to the graph on the right, um, <laughs> I make this joke, I call moss everybody's friend. Uh, maybe if you're in Western Oregon and you have moss on your roof, moss isn't your friend so much, but, um, perhaps if you're a lichen or a bunch grass moss is your friend that uh, here I'm just looking at the summed effects of with the purple moss on grass cover you can see it's a positive effect um, there's a different composition of grasses that we're getting with increased moss cover and increased moss cover is also associated with increased lichen cover so some punch lines here, uh, increased cover of biocrust is related to reduced cover of cheatgrass, and moss is everybody's friend. So uh, kind of running with this idea that moss is everybody's friend, uh, when I started this work, I wanted to see if we could restore biological soil crust in the Great Basin. 
and it seemed to make sense to start with mosses because um, work by Ro Roger Rosentretter and Marcelo Serpe out of Boise State showed that uh, in the greenhouse they could get mosses to regenerate with fragmentation and so I wanted to see if we could take this out in the field and get mosses to regenerate. And so that resulted in the following publication. And I can't remember if I mentioned that I do have a background in restoration ecology. And um, doing restoration on arid lands and in the Great Basin, a lot of what will ensure your success is if you have soil moisture, soil water. So we're really focused on increasing soil moisture and soil water. And you can do that pretty directly with irrigation, but um, that's, that's not always something that people have access to. And uh, another way to go about it is increasing the organic matter of the soil. That increases the water holding capacity of the soil. It also increases the boundary layer of the soil, so you have less evaporation from the soil surface. Uh, other things that are frequently done are planting in a different season. So you might opt to plant in the fall as opposed to in the spring, thinking that if you can plant right before a precip event, then that plant's going to have access to soil water, can put out some new roots, you might have a better chance of surviving into the next year. And something else that we often work with are ecotypes, for native plants at least, that if you can pick a a plant that's more, um, that's from a site that's more similar climatically to the site that you're trying to restore, that maybe there's a chance that that particular plant, that particular ecotype might do better in that site that you're trying to restore. And we didn't know if this would be true for mosses. So we wanted to address all of these factors here. <laughs> and um, yeah, did it with the following study. So I focused on two common mosses in the Great Basin. Uh, the first is Bryum argentium, and Bryum is a cosmopolitan moss, so it, it occurs all over the world. It occurs globally. And Bryum is kind of funny in that if you're looking at a moss, this is a short moss. So it's less than a centimeter tall, and short mosses tend to be the more ruderal moss species. They're weedier. Um, versus a tall moss, and to be a tall moss, you're over one centimeter tall. And some tricky realis on the right here is a tall moss, and it's thought to be a later successional moss. And the different pictures that I'm showing there, you know, you see it kind of um, dry and shriveled looking on the right. Uh, that's just it in its resting state. But if you were to spray water on it, it would instantly light up and look like the two moss pictures that are kind of in the center of the slide there. And we wanted to get mosses from very different uh, and environmentally distinct sites. So we picked a cool, moist site, um, Steens Mountain Cooperative Management and Protection Area. And this site could be characterized by intermontane plateaus. It's of higher elevation and has an average freeze-free period of 60 days. And we contrasted this with the Morley Nelson Birds of Prey National Conservation Area. And this site is dominated by lava plateaus. It's of lower elevation. It has an average freeze-free period of 127 days. So you could say that it's a warm, dry site. And um, uh, in regards to our test site, our restoration site, where we did this experiment, we did it in Madras, Oregon. And so Birds of Prey National Conservation Area climatically is more similar to Madras, Oregon than the Steens is. And just for reference there, I think I've got people listening in from Reno, Nevada, or I know I do, and Corvallis, Oregon. And so um, you can kind of see that with the two little push pins on my Google Earth map and where you are in relation to where we got our mosses and where we planted them out. And I do want to give a quick thank you to the BLM who funded this work and allowed us to collect mosses at those sites. Okay, so um, talking a little bit about experimental design, uh, this was pretty much a full factorial 
uh, study in that we looked at um, mosses from two different locations. We had two different species. Um, we looked at them with and without organic matter. Organic matter, um, we used jute net for organic matter just on the soil surface. Uh, we inoculated in two seasons, so that's a fall and a spring season. And where it becomes kind of an unbalanced design is where is that we only irrigated in the spring season of the first year of the study. So jumping right into some results, um, I'm just showing you I'm showing you the data here, and this is uh, the amount of growth we saw of centricia through time, and if you look at that first graph on the top, um, you can see that the centricia grew in kind of a stair-step fashion. So in the first season, first year, we had pretty much nothing that happened. In the second year, we got an increase in cover, and in the, into the third year, we got a third increase in cover after winter season um, sampling. And so the two source populations I referred to, birds of prey, is always going to be shown in green. Steens is always going to be shown in purple. If a line is dashed, that means that the moss received irrigation in the first season, and a solid line means no irrigation. So we can see in that first graph that the birds of prey moss tended to do better than the Steens moss, the purple lines there, and that irrigation didn't really make a difference. So if we move down to the next graph, uh, these are all treatments that included jute. And again, with irrigation, it didn't seem like irrigation made too much of a difference. But the last graph is a jute difference graph. So it's a particular treatment combination, um, the cover achieved with jute minus the cover achieved without jute. And so anything above the zero line means that jute had a positive effect. And you can see that that's true here for centricia, that we got more growth um, by this moss with jute than without. And moving into Brian. Uh, Brian's story is a little bit more complicated. Uh, there's still that stair step in the first graph there, and I have to say the graphs do follow what you saw in the last slide of the first graph is with and without irrigation. Uh, the second graph brings in jute, and again, with and without irrigation, dash lines, irrigation, solid line, no irrigation, and the last graph being a jute difference graph. So going back up to the first graph, we do see that stair step. Moving down to the second graph, um, we had a really interesting interaction between jute and irrigation where I feel like <laughs> we were kind of executing climate change scenarios on the moss without my realizing it at that point in time, that we got a lot of growth by Bryam in just a few weeks after inoculation, but as it became warmer in central Oregon, we started killing off the moss with that spring irrigation. And if you look at that second graph and follow it through time, you can see that by our last sampling date, um, the Bryum is still, it's, it's just on its way to recovering to the same amount of cover as moss that we didn't irrigate at all. Okay, and so moving down to that last graph, um, anything positive represents a positive effect of jute on the moss, and you can see that that was pretty consistent except for where we irrigated the moss in the spring season. Okay, so the other factor that I mentioned but I haven't talked about until now is that we inoculated the moss in two different seasons, so a spring versus a fall inoculation, you know, thinking that with plant restoration where you plant in the fall, you might be facilitating growth because uh, you're closer to precip, um, when precip would happen than not. And um, so I've got my four, well, okay, so ST represents the steens, BOP represents birds of prey, moss. We've got both Bryum, the ruderal species here, and on the right, centricia, the later successional species. And you can see error bars um, for these four different mosses, um, all intersect zero. So we didn't see an effect of 
inoculating in a different season for moss that was put out on its own. However, if we did put out moss with jute net, I think we extended the growing season of that moss. So um, you can see that most of these um, differences in mean cover between uh, moss inoculated in the spring versus the fall with jute uh, are positive, and the only one with error bars that intersect zero is Brian from the Steens. So jute net with uh, moss inoculated in the spring had a very positive effect on moss growth. Okay, just wanted to share a pretty moss picture there. Uh, my friend Rebecca Durham, who's a biocrust enthusiast and a great photographer, shared this one with me. So you can see uh, the moss that I'm discussing here. So, because it seems like we're almost out of time, um, what we now know in 2017 about biological soil crust, I think we can pretty confidently say that biological soil crust occur across the Great Basin, uh, that lichens and mosses are associated with reduced cover of cheatgrass, and that mosses can be restored quickly in the Great Basin without irrigation. And um, in my last life, I guess current life too, as a restoration ecologist, um, I'm excited about the BioCrest work, but I'm also really excited to have a new restoration tool where we can quickly achieve native cover uh, without irrigation in the system, because it's hard when you have to water everything. It's just not always possible. Okay, and I want to leave you with a, a final thought. Uh, that we should manage for biocrust in addition to plant communities across the Great Basin. And a few more pretty pictures with some acknowledgments of those that took the pictures. And if there's any questions, um, I'm happy to take them. Great. Thank you so much, Lee. Uh, sure. First question, what methods did you use for inoculation? Hmm. Um, well, so <laughs> how to say this briefly. So first I fragmented the moss and I just rubbed it through a soil sieve so that we would have smaller pieces of moss and more likely get uh, even coverage when we spread it out. But I made a slurry with water and uh, let the slurry sit for about 15 minutes before spreading it on the soil surface because um, moss physiology is such that they should be fully photosynthesizing after being um, kept wet for 15 minutes. So hope Great. that answers that question. Great, thank you. Um, and I forgot to mention, uh, if you have questions, please um, in your control panel open your questions window and type your questions in there. All right, um, Ali, I have a question. So I was a little bit confused in the structural model when you were talking about um, inactive grazing plots. It looked like inactive plots. Um, with inactive plots, you see a decrease in um, mosses and lichens and and um, you know other vegetation. So I'm I'm confused. Is that saying that because uh, active the active grazing part seemed to go away? So is that saying that those well, plants are improved by grazing? Um, sorry, I didn't explain that very well. So anything that didn't show up in the preliminary resulting model um, was a factor that wasn't found to be significant in the model. So it just means, um, you know, I had active AUMs on those sites, but the proportion of active AUMs we didn't see as having a relationship with um, bio crust or grass cover in that way. It doesn't mean that it doesn't have an effect. It's just that, um, you know, where I feel like if we went out with an experiment and uh, brought some cows out there and saw what they did, we would see an effect. But for this particular variable of the number, the proportion of active AUMs, um, we didn't see a difference in bio crust cover, bunch grass cover amongst plots if that makes sense. But I think what um, really jumped out at me with that is that where there were suspended AUMs, so where um, livestock was 
were taken off of given allotments, we saw that signature still on the landscape, that that resulted in less shrub cover, less bunch grass cover. Okay, I get it. All right, thank you. Sure. Um, another question, what concentration proportion of mosses were used in the slurry? What? Mm, it was all moss in the slurry. Well, okay, so maybe maybe this will get at it. So uh, my little uh, treatment plots were really just five by seven inches, so little seedling flats, and I used a gram of dried moss in the slurry for each one of those flats. So however that would work out, that would be your moss rate of inoculation, I guess. Great, thank you. Um, and another question I have, um, so in the, towards the beginning when you showed the, um, the great graph of all the, uh, the, the amount of plots that had lichen, moss, um, both or nothing, that, that's just, that is a snapshot for when that AIM data was taken. Is there any, I'm just wondering, you know, those gray bars where there's, you know, plots without any moss or lichen, um, do we, is there any way to, is there any data from history that you can go back and tell if that number, you know, is decreasing significantly, if it's the same, or is that all we have is the snapshot in time? Um, I think for these sites right now, we just have a snapshot in time. I'm, I'm hoping to go back and visit some of these places, but um, I've just, I've just been at the stage of looking at the data and kind of mapping it out and trying to pull out some of those relationships. So um, yeah. that's what we have at the moment. Great, thanks. Um, another question, did you place tall mosses under shrubs or just in interspaces? Um, just in the interspaces. I was curious about, um, uh, you know, what shrub cover or shade cover might do for these mosses, that often you do see a lot more moss under shrub. Um, but I, I didn't look at that. And actually, I have to share my little fake shade structure didn't work out so well because I had a lot of clay in the soil, and so they kept moving as they were getting wet, so we dropped that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks. Um, another question. Washington BLM has recently started collecting AIM data with GBI folks. Do you see a possibility of anyone expanding this research to the Columbia Plateau in the future? Yeah, for sure. Um, <laughs> did I mention that I'm a postdoc? <laughs> yeah, no, I, there's definitely a lot of biocrust in the Columbia Basin, and I'd like to see more work being done there. And, um, yeah, if we see the same patterns, I would be interested to know. Great. Uh, what was the range of time since fire used in your model? Thank you. <laughs> Um, so the oldest fire was 1970, it was on that slide, uh, whether it was 2001 or 2003, I don't quite remember, but I think that puts us to a decade, you know, well, we're in that range of time since fire, so not the oldest fires, but at least a couple of decades of recovery that we could see. Great, thank you. Do biocrust seem to have an impact on fire susceptibility? Um, well, that's a good question. So, um, you know, they would be in the inner spaces, and uh, they would likely affect the fuel load and continuity. So, we do know that where we have more bio crust, we have less, um, at least cheatgrass cover. So, you would think less annual invasive grass cover. Um, so, that should reduce the fuel continuity, and um, so. If you had more biocrust on a site, you just, I think, wouldn't be able to carry fire as much is the thought. Great, thank you. Um, I've worked on soils in the Great Basin and in Scent, Oregon. My question is in regards to the vascular crusting in the soil as it relates to biocrust, specifically as a variable. Um, well, physical crust is really something different. And so, I don't know if I said it right. It, it said vesicular crusting, and I might have said vascular. Um, Sorry. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, you got it. <laughs> well, maybe read the question one more time. I'm not totally sure what they're getting at. 
Um, let's see. In regards to vesicular crusting in the soil as it relates to bio crust, um, can you use it as a variable? And if you want to clarify, um, James, your question, you're welcome to type in again. But did that give you, could you use it as a variable? Is that the question? Huh. I mean, maybe it would have an effect on the community. You would, you would see that um, vesicular crusting being just that you have like little bubbles on the soil surface. Um, but, you know, it would be, I would take it as like an environmental variable that might affect uh, which crust could grow well on a particular site. But I haven't looked at it. And I can't say that I can think of anybody that has. But, yeah, something to think about. Great, thanks. Um, in your work, have you studied biological soil crusts on treated burned areas? If so, did you find or observe any treatment effects on biological soil crusts? On treated burned areas. So, like, you think they mean prescribed fire? That's what I'm assuming, but if you want to clarify. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I guess regardless, I haven't, I haven't yet seen. Seedings and herbicide is the clarification. Oh, and seedings and herbicide. Um, I have to say, I'm starting to work on some of this. I know some others are too. Uh, results aren't in yet, but I think that's coming. Okay, so for a future webinar. Yeah, future <laughs> webinar. <laughs> All right. Well, that looks like the last question. If you're still typing a question, please continue to do so. Um, but in the meantime, I want to thank you all for your participation. We would greatly appreciate it if you would take our three question survey that will appear after the webinar has ended. I will post the recording of this webinar on our Great Basin Fire Science Exchange YouTube channel this afternoon, and the link will be automatically sent to you through the GoToWebinar system tomorrow. And this is our last webinar of the season, so thank you all for joining us. It will still include webinars um, from our partners in our newsletters, but as far as the Great Basin Fire Science Exchange webinars, um, we will resume those in the fall. Um, so if you have any further questions regarding this or future webinars, please email or call me anytime. Um, let's see. Oh, it looks like there was a clarification for that last question, or the second to last question. The soil vesicular crust is often overlooked and may explain a large part of the presence, absence, or persistence of bio crust. Do you have any comment on that? Um, I'd like to look into it, but no, I have nothing to add to that. Okay. Thank you for the clarification, and thanks for that final comment. All right, so again, thank you for attending, and thank you, Lee, for your presentation. Okay, thank you. All right, have a great summer, everyone.